in the meantime, I do want to introduce our first guest. He is the Adonis, the Greek god of the legislature, Delegate J.B. <laughs> Akers. J.B., can you hear us? I can hear you fine, and I think I'm probably just going to hang up after that. I didn't want to go down <laughs> helping there, buddy. <laughs> J.B., what, did you watch last night? You, what, your thoughts? I was actually, my, my brother-in-law's birthday was last night, so we had a family get-together. So last night was apolitical for me, so I apologize. <laughs> I mean, I, I read the news. I saw some of the images. I saw some video clips that I didn't actually watch live. So your thoughts on the pick for uh, vice president then? Well, I, it wasn't a, a huge shock. I think he's done the short list for a while. I think one of the comments before that he is, I think the perception is that he's, uh, more of a, uh, I guess, a harder right candidate. But in some ways, that's not completely true. I mean, if you look at some of his positions, which are very populist, and I think those populist positions are starting to align more with conservative ideology. But, you know, traditionally, he's been pretty, um, you know, friendly towards some of the union efforts, as an example. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's not what you would call a traditional, at least not a traditional big business or chamber of commerce Republican position, at least. Uh, and there's been some other things that he doesn't align. He breaks ranks with Republicans on some other issues. I think you see, you know, like Senate leadership. I'm not sure that Mitch McConnell is necessarily a huge fan of J.D. Vance. I think, you know, a lot of people probably like that. I don't know if you all saw it. I did see a clip where Mitch McConnell, I guess, got booed. Yes, he got booed uh, pretty, pretty darn badly. Yeah, so, you know, I think to some extent, uh, if you're perceived as being anti-establishment, which I think J.D. Vance, at least in some ways, is, even though he's a Silicon Valley venture capitalist guy, but I think he's seen as being, to some extent, anti-establishment. That helps his street cred under the current environment. Uh, so I, I think it's for Trump, uh, you know, it's, it's a good pick, I think, in terms of what the message he's trying to send, uh, you know, this you know, the non-interventionist policy that I think a lot of Republicans are now in favor of. I mean, we now have this strange flip where you see things like Democrats want to intervene in foreign wars, uh, which used to be something that was anathema to them. You have conservatives who are like, wait a minute, what are we doing, you know, getting involved somewhere where it's you know, probably none of our business? Yeah, that's a more complicated issue. But, you know, J.D. Vance falls, I think, on the right side of that ideology for a lot of the more populist uh, Republicans these days. So. So, J.B., um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Obviously, this is the first time you, you're here. You, rep, you represent South Charleston, is that correct? No, well, so I've got, I've got um, a pretty big chunk of Kanawha County. Uh, I've got maybe what you're thinking of is I've got about half of what's called South Hills in Charleston. Okay, yeah. And then I've got, I've got the uh, a big piece of the eastern part of Kanawha County, and then I've got basically all of uh, southern Kanawha County. And then my district does take up... A small part of South Charleston. Um, there's a couple other delegates who have more of South Charleston than me, but I've got some of South Charleston. So it's a, you know, I go over like west, if you know where this is, to Tornado, which is almost in Putnam County. So my district is, it's a big district and it's pretty diverse geographically. It's also, it's one of the few purple districts in the state uh, by voter registration. It's pretty close to 50 50 Democrat and Republican because about half my votes are in Charleston. And, you know, despite the, uh, you know, conventional wisdom, you know, West Virginia is definitely a Trump state and mostly a red state, but the city of Charleston, other places like the city of Morgantown, you guys have some spots over where you are, Eastern Panhandle. Uh, the city of Charleston is a very blue city. Uh, so, uh, but the rest of my district, as soon as you leave city limits, like as soon as you step over the city limit line, it becomes, you know, very red. So it's a diverse area yeah. that I represent. But I, Go ahead, I'm sorry. You, you took over from, or were appointed to take over from Moore Capita, correct? Yeah, that's right. So when yeah. Moore resigned, it was actually, you know, almost right before the legislative session, um, I was appointed to fill his seat. I was appointed the day before the session started, so I had less than 24 hours uh, notice. Uh, and, and I believe you were speaking was, on the floor within 24 hours. No, not like the rest of us who waited a year because we were too scared. <laughs> I think you. What I'm saying is, you really took to the ground running, uh, in my opinion. Well, I, well, I, I tried. I, I hope I didn't talk too much. Although, as a lawyer, people probably think that I do. But I, I tried to speak on issues only when I thought it was important or I had something uh, really to add. I didn't go there just to hear the sound of my own voice because uh, nobody wants that. Um, so I tried to be helpful when I could, but in this first session, Mike, and of course you have uh, Height there also, I want to say hi to him, and then John Gilstrap, I don't, I don't know you, but I read about you before I got on here, congratulations on all your success. But, um, Thank you. You know, I, tr 
I tried to build relationships this first session. I didn't go in there with my own agenda. I, I don't think that I've got all the answers. No one does. Uh, and I mainly just tried to meet people, build relationships, find out what's important to the rest of the folks, uh, you know, in, in the House, especially the Republican caucus, and then just be a helpful part of the team, uh, you know. And when I did speak, I hope that I helped advance the ball. I mean, there were a few times I spoke out against a few issues, but I didn't. I try not to do that too much. Uh, so, Mike, good morning, JB. Hey, buddy. How are you today? I'm doing well. So, listen, I want to go back to the convention, and, and you mentioned uh, a little bit of how JB aligns with the, the unions from time to time. What are your thoughts about the uh, the union boss, uh, the Teamsters Union president, uh, coming and speaking at the Republican National Convention? I mean, it, it's an amazing shift. It's something that you wouldn't have even told as a bad joke in the not-too-distant past. It never would have happened. Uh, you see some uh, you know, union leadership up in New York, where Donald Trump is from, where you know, Donald Trump is you know, broadly unpopular in New York, but he's actually popular with some of the unions up there. Um, so there's just been a shift, and it's just populist. And I think, you know, again, let me say this first. I've got lots of Democrats in my family. I'm not someone who tries to you know, throw a grenade at the other side or say that one side's always right, one side's always wrong. But clearly, I mean, this is, I think, objectively true. The Democrat Party, definitely at the national level, has left the working class behind. They've lost the messaging with them. They don't know how to talk to them anymore. Uh, they are um, you know, incoherent in what they are trying to uh, do for the working class, and that working class continues to shift towards the conservative. I won't even say Republicans as much as just more of a conservative ideology, which I mean, that obviously is going to be the Republican Party. Uh, but, you know, you see that, I mean, this state of West Virginia is no better example, uh, guys. And, you know, when I was growing up, I've been a Republican since the day I registered to vote when I was 18, even though almost every one of my family was a Democrat. Uh, so that's a long story. I mean, I just, I just knew, you know, it's one of those things where it's like I met my wife and I just knew that I loved her. And when I registered to be a voter, I just knew for whatever reason that I was a Republican, despite most folks weren't. And I didn't have anybody to vote for most of the time for a long time i mean I, I would be in a primary there would be literally no one on my side of the ballot in the primary in a lot of the races and by the time you got to the general election the, the election was over right so right. and that shift has been dramatic and you know in southern west virginia for example where there's still a, a lot of uh, strong union uh empathy you've got a lot of people there you know still have ties to the coal industry those people are politically conservative even though they've got strong union backgrounds and you're starting to see that work class ideology all across the country and like jd vance i think is a good example of that he's, he's tapped into that to some extent uh and it's a real problem for the democrats and it's a problem that i'm glad that the republicans are uh, i'm not going to say taking advantage of it probably comes across the wrong way but you know those should be our voters i mean the people who are you know patriotic americans the people who are america first and guys there's nothing wrong with saying america first and that's another place where I think that you have the working class people who scratch their heads and say, you know, why does the Democrat Party sometimes, again, at least at the national level, tell us that having an America first platform is somehow wrong or bad? Uh, I mean, sometimes they'll tell us that we're racist or bigoted for, for wanting to be America first. I mean, that's what we should be, and not to anyone else's detriment. I mean, I want us to win, and I guess that means that you know, we'll do better than other countries, but we should. Uh, and I think that's part of what's going on with this, with the working class movement that's having this shift towards uh, side of the aisle. I'm glad to have them. I love having that, that group of people with us. John Gilstrap. Hey, JB. Nice to meet you. Um, are, are you comfortable talking about Judge Cannon's decision to drop the uh, documents case against Donald Trump? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to the extent that I, I know about it, and I won't pretend like I've done some deep dive into it, but it's a... Uh, legally, it's a fascinating uh, decision because it's got really broad ramifications. Uh, if that decision stands, and let's keep in mind that's one district court judge's decision, uh, I assume the government will appeal that, and you know that's something that potentially can wind up in front of the U.S. Supreme Court if it goes that route. Uh, so this may not be the final decision, but for now, it's obviously good news for 
President Trump. And it's, I think it's also another expression of the times that we're in where there is a very strong belief in this country that the federal government has just expanded beyond any reasonable measure of what we perceived it, you know, it, its role to be. Uh, and, you know, another example of that, to, to draw attention to another case, was the case that overruled the Chevron Doctrine uh, about a month or so ago, uh, where the Supreme Court basically said that these administrative agencies have been overstepping their bounds and exceeding their powers. And I think this judge in Florida, Judge Cannon, that was an expression of the same thought process, which is, you know, you can't have the Attorney General of the United States going out and appointing what, in effect, is a, a, a second attorney general in this situation with unlimited powers, unlimited spending, unlimited discretion, no uh, controls whatsoever, and that that should be something that Congress is in charge of. And, you know, so we'll, we'll see if legally that decision holds up, but I think it's, a, again, a fascinating legal decision. I'm actually, you know, I'm not always a result-oriented guy. I think we should do what's right whether it means the person you want to win, you know, wins or loses. I mean, the institutions are important, but um, I'm glad she made the decision based upon my reading of the case. I don't think you can objectively say she was wrong. I think she makes some very good points, and I'm actually more interested to see where the case goes because I think it's an important decision in terms of making sure that these appointments are actually valid. I think we've gotten to the point to the extent where we just assume that this is something that the government can do, and really... Maybe the government shouldn't have been doing this all along. This may have been wrong before the Trump case. So um, anyway, it's um, that was when I came out. I was uh, I was I was glad to see that decision. Assuming assuming that that this holds up, um, the last part of her decision uh, says that <clears throat> excuse me that the the uh, Congress with the president is welcome to. Uh, give this case over to a U.S. attorney and have them right. have them develop the case that way. But as a practical matter, if all of the warrants and all of the evidence was collected under the 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 Jack um, Cannon the, the the special prosecutor's yeah. um, jurisdiction, um, isn't that all fruit from the poisonous tree? I think that's the right legal term. Is it? You can't revive this case under those circumstances, can you? I mean, it's a practical legal yeah, matter. Well, yeah, well, I mean, again, again, you're talking about, like, high-level legal theory here, but I think that that's a good argument, John. And if, if Jack Smith's appointment was that's unconstitutional right. from day one, then any work that he did from, I mean, if I was Trump's lawyer, I would absolutely say, yeah, anything that Jack Smith did unconstitutionally is dead in the water. Uh, can't be used in any uh, proceeding from this point on. I mean, it's the same thing as, you know, like you said, let's take it down to a, a more common uh, you know, scenario where if you just have the police who enter your house without, uh, you know, a proper search warrant and they come in just start looking around uh, without legal permission and they find whatever, they find a bag of weed in your house and they, uh, they charge you because of that. Well, as soon as you prove that the police were in your house illegally and that was an unconstitutional search and seizure, then you're free and clear, even if you were 100 percent guilty. So in this situation, John, I think you know, there's a very good argument that what you said is true. So, J.B., you're on uh, Judiciary Committee, correct? Yes, sir. Are you working? Are you actively working on any um, new laws for next session? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been talking to some folks about some things they'd like to see happen. I mean, again, uh, you know, my thing, again, cause I'm a, this is my first session, this yeah. last session, and everybody, want, everybody wants to come in and say, hey, I'm the smartest, I'm the hardest worker, uh, I've got all the best ideas, uh, you know, you, you want to give a perception that you are you know, going to go out there and do great things, and I, I, I am a hard worker, and I, I do want to achieve great things, but again, uh, I don't want you guys, I don't want Height and Hornby and the rest of the guys in the legislature to think that I'm you know, some sort of know-it-all and that I, I'm going to come in and tell you guys what's best for you know, the state of West Virginia, including where you live. So That's what they've been uh, telling me I, all morning. Well, that's what Hornby's <laughs> been saying all morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's not entertaining radio unless you guys get a little bit of that. So, so we, we, uh, go into, anyway. we go into a uh, special session at the end of the month. Uh, the governor's announced yeah. he wants us to uh, add an additional 5% right, um, right. tax cut. 
um, to the income tax. Your thoughts on his proposal versus what you've heard from the Senate and uh, your other colleagues. Well, so as Republicans, you know, we're uh, supposed to love all tax cuts. And, you know, as a, as a rule, I do. I mean, the less taxes people pay with the functioning government, the better. I will say that I was actually at the um, that budget ceremony or that surplus ceremony the day the governor announced it. And that was the first I'm aware of that anyone from the legislature had been told about it. Or well, the Senate uh, is from what I heard, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from the Senate, Senate warehouse, either side. I mean, to, it, it appeared to me, and I had some conversations with some high-ranking people there, that uh, they weren't given a warning ahead. And I think, you know, I, I, I like Governor Justice, but I think politically um, he probably did that on purpose to put some pressure on us. It's like, hey, guys, here's what we need to do, and then we're forced to react to it. Uh, you know, my view is um, I know a lot of conservatives want to hear, yes, tax cut every single time, but you have to have – you know, you have to be able to build roads. You've got to be able to lay water and sewer lines. We need broadband. Uh, you know, we need functioning schools. Uh, and, you know, we've got to be able to pay, even if it's not public school, people want both scholarships. So people want, uh, you know, uh, you know, to be able to you know, school their kids at home with, uh, you know, taxpayer funded support. We've got to be able to pay for some of those things. So we just got to make sure that the governor's proposed cut allows us to continue to function. And we've got a lot of liabilities. You guys know this. You've been on some, uh, you know, threads we're on. And mm -hmm. we've got some liabilities that are about to increase that we've already um, dedicated ourselves to. Uh, so if we want to continue to have a flat line budget and not find ourselves having to increase some other tax in a couple of years because we cut this one, we just got to make sure we're doing it the right way. Yeah, we got to make sure we have a plan. I think the House is pretty good at tr making sure we have a plan and all of us understand what that plan is, correct? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's the hope. I mean, yeah. every once in a while something will pop up that you're you know, maybe not 100% ready for. But, no, I think generally speaking, you know, the House, at least, on, I mean, this is even before I got there. You guys were there and experienced this before me. But it seems like especially on some of these economic issues or tax plans, I mean, the House has been pretty um, – it's, it's been a pretty strong team effort on the House side. You guys have had some overwhelmingly uh, you know, strong votes uh, in the direction of uh, some of these you know, tax policies, sometimes against the governor's wishes, right? I mean, so it seems like the House does a pretty good job on that. That's all. Yeah, I would agree. I, I'm somewhat concerned about this. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the way it, kind of, it, it came out, you know, sort of out of the blue. I'm also concerned that we, we that the law that we put into effect is barely two years old, and we're already talking yeah. about circumventing the the right. trigger mechanisms that we put into that law, or, uh, or enhancing the trigger or, mechanisms, or, or, right, is, or is, enhancing is the trigger. Word, you know, two years in, <laughs> and you know, JB, you bring up a great point. There, there's some. Uh, there's some things that are going to come into play here in January that, that are going to hit the revenue streams. And until we really know how those affect the budget, um, it, I just think it's irresponsible to, to start giving even bigger cuts. And, you know, as a Republican, I, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I love tax cuts. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, the, the whole reason we put triggers into effect was – because we wanted responsible tax cuts uh, over time, and it just seems yeah. like we're we're circumventing that right now, and and I have I have grave concerns. Well, let's make sure your listeners know too. I mean, when we're sitting here, and like some of them might say, "Wait a minute, are these guys saying they don't want to cut my taxes?" Please keep in mind that there's going to be another personal income tax cut this year already. Right. Uh, so this will be multiple years in a row. So all of us are in favor of that. But it's like, you know, a good example where everybody can go back and Google what happened in Kansas a half dozen years or so ago where Kansas got um, overly aggressive, cut to the point where they couldn't fund some of their, you know, constitutionally mandated uh, programs. And they wound up having to raise taxes to fix that problem. So uh, we, everybody who's listening to this uh, who pays personal income taxes is going to be in line for a, a decrease on your personal income taxes this year. So you're already going to get a cut. That's let's, right. Let's JB, I really want to thank good. you for joining us. Time flies when you're having fun. We have reached our time limit for this segment. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we will, are you going to be at the Greenbrier this weekend? Uh, this weekend, I won't, buddy. I'll be there okay. next month for another meeting. But right. you guys have to go live large without me. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great day.